Yes, and we don't need scaling jokes. We don't need mic jokes either. Um, <laughs> it's, I've heard them all. Um, my job this morning is to, is to set the tone uh, because I get to go first. So it could either go tremendously well and I set a good tone or I could set a low bar so that everybody else, all the other speakers, feel great about themselves. So it could go of one of two ways, but um, I'm hoping... I don't know which one I'm hoping for. Just, yeah, just don't boo me off the stage. Um, I, I, as part of that, I decided to go quite bare bones with my slides. Um, I often obsess over my slides too much, so I decided to just draw them this year and scan them all in, which was going well until I decided I wanted to do some animations. And then I'm sitting there, like, drawing animations out and then wondering why I didn't just make slides. Um, so we'll see. I'm talking about just enough scale to survive. Um, and really, that's, it's one of my like pet hates is how focused some of uh, us have become on premature scaling. And uh, so that's what, I gave a very small lightning talk at DevOps days about it, and I thought it would actually be better to just like build on it for this talk. Um, so who am I? What right have I got to stand here and talk to you this morning? Um, and actually, um, if you ask Home Affairs, um, as you can tell, I'm not from here. Uh, if you ask Home Affairs, I have no critical skills. Um, so I'm actually, I've got five months left before they kick me out. Um, and then I have to go through the whole process all over again because I have no critical skills. Because apparently, unless you have a piece of paper that says you're awesome, you're not awesome. And I didn't go to university, so I'm not awesome. Um, my name is Mike Jones. I'm sick of maps everywhere. Twitter, GitHub, etc. Um, I don't hate maps, but maps is spam backwards. Um, I am the CTO at Pixar, and uh, that's my current role. And uh, we we provide uh, mainly in the in the farm worker space. Um, we provide financial products that um, is there to basically make sure that people who are earning less than three thousand rand a month um, actually can save uh, money that in a way that's inflation beating, um, which is very hard. Um, I don't know if you would think about for yourself living on 3,000 Rand a month. Um, some of you are probably blowing that this afternoon at uh, some takeaway or some bar somewhere. Um, but uh, there's plenty of people in this country that are living on less than 3,000 Rand a month. And uh, um, we're working on financial products that essentially mean they get stop getting shafted by uh, loan sharks and various people like that. And my role there is CTO. And um, actually, when I, when I started looking at um, my last talk I gave at ScaleConf four years ago, I was like, I better make sure I don't say the same thing. Although, given how many people weren't here then, I could probably get away with doing the same presentation again, because um, it was, wasn't bad. Um, and so I did this, I did the kind of version of this slide before when I was, I was kind of saying that actually we have versions as much as our software have versions, if you look at your history. And I was kind of writing this out, and it reminded me, um, um, I, I'm, a, I'm a Christian, I go to church and I read the Bible, and um, there's whole parts of the Bible which are really boring, which are like, um, this person begat this person, I think it basically means had a kid. Um, and uh, it's like there's whole sections of the Bible that are like this begat, this begat, this begat, this. And most of the time, you just like swoosh straight over them because it's like, yeah, right. Um, but apparently genealogy is important to people. Um, and as I was writing out this, I was like, yeah, yeah, blah, blah. Um, and then I realized, I, rem I was reminded of a, a preach I heard once at church where once somebody just preached on one of those begat lists, and it was the genealogy of, of Jesus. And actually, if you look at the genealogy of Jesus, it's full of like terrible people doing terrible things. There's like, like murderers in there in the genealogy, and it's like murderers and prostitutes and, and foreigners, everyone that everyone hates. And so I was like, <laughs> I was like, Wow, I was actually like looking through my thing going, oh, that was a bit of a dodgy era. I made loads of mistakes there. And, and actually, I'm not saying I'm like Jesus, but um, <laughs> <laughs> that would be one step too far. But like, I was just, just like looking at this. And actually, sometimes it's really good to just stop and look at where you've come from and, and look at the mistakes you've made. And f f once again, refresh and look. Like, where was the mistakes that I made that, that actually 
I can actually learn from today. So I learned, basically what I'm, I'm talking through today is the different things that have shaped um, my, my opinions, which you may not agree with, and we can, you can tell me why I'm wrong afterwards. Um, but each of these phases have, have, I have, I've within my career made lots of premature scaling issues. And like you'll see like one here, this is a wonderful one, version six, mobile app developer, 2004, got that timing spot on. Um, that was uh, Windows Mobile version one, which was the, uh, the device that introduced us all to the concept of rebooting your phone. Before, <laughs> like, before that, phones just turned on and called people, suddenly you rebooted things. Um, and then you can see I kind of went rogue in, the, in eight and nine. I worked in sales for like three years and then in marketing for two years. And uh, yeah, we won't, it, it taught me a lot though. It's a lot of empathy. Um, so uh, it's what's funny is every time you shift between one like part of a company to another, everyone says, ooh, you're going to the dark side. But like everybody else thinks the other side is the dark side. It's like, no, there must be, there must be a dark side. And I think it, maybe it is marketing. Um, <laughs> So let's talk about survival. Um, and then that was my, I like put in my abstract like to the guys. I went through the same process. I filled in the form, same as you. Um, and then I was like, when I actually sat down to, to write out the slides and stuff, I was like, oh, that's really negative. Like, that's like saying, let's talk about tax. Um, should we talk about tax for the next 45 minutes? And so I was like, no, let's talk about thrival, because that's a good word. Um, so um, I, I think I've made that up. Um, there's, probably, there's probably a brand out there that sells socks called Thrival or something. Um, but I'm, I'm going to talk about s some tips that I have for kind of thriving and not just surviving. So you'll put up with my made up words, hopefully. Um, and so in the theme of like, what stuff did I learn from sales, the most um, useful book a salesperson ever gave me was this book called The First 90 Days. And it was in the era when I went rogue and joined a corporate. I had to wear shoes, I had to wear a tie sometimes, it was a dark day. Um, but somebody gave me this book when I switched roles in the company called The First 90 Days. Um, has anyone read it? No? Excellent. So it, it sounds, what I should have just said, I've come up with this wonderful concept. Um, and uh, what it is, is um, when, you, when you start with a company, most of the time, or in a new role, you actually start with like negative net value to the company because it cost them to recruit you. It cost the, the they paid recruiters or they took time out of their day to, to stop working on something and come and work with you. So when you join a company, you're actually starting with like a negative balance. Um, or you start in a new role, you're starting with a negative balance. And they've, they've analyzed lots and lots of, uh, of data and it basically it works out that you've, you've roughly got 90 days in a new company before you're your sort of net value to the company can break even. And um, so what I want to talk about is just like some of the tactics that you can do that, that really are about thriving in a way that makes it quicker to get to the point where you might survive in your job. Um, and so there's like this bit, so you start and then the first thing you don't go and do is you get all these meetings with other people where you ask them to tell you everything that they know about the job that you've, they've hired you to do so that you can be successful. And so you just keep getting worse. Like the day you join, the more meetings you have, the more time you're sucking out of people. And, um, but you've got to work really hard to push for that like, point at which you, you break even. And then hopefully you'll hit that point, you'll feel good about yourself. Um, and I would, I would really like, encourage you guys to focus on slow and steady. Um, with your work processes, because if you just keep trying to work at the like first 90 days pace, you'll burn out. Um, so this is my this is my tip one for like getting through the first 90 days, where you can come up with things that help your company's um, scale 
whether it be from a development output, um, new things being added to the to the product, or whether it's through literal like can we handle more users, literal scaling of uh, of of the output of the of the product that's already built. And my 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 primary and first tip is like work on on time boxes um, where you split your time into um, some very specific um, goals to win and push for um, for like exponential wins and the way i've seen this work really well is i split my my time in a batch we don't use um we we stopped using the word sprints a little while ago because i realized um, I was reading something and someone mentioned this word batch and I was like this makes so much more sense because the worst thing you can do in my experience when writing software is run because generally you're going to trip over with a tray in your hand and smash your face on the floor um, and then you have to keep picking yourself back up again. So I really like the word batch because it, it sort of suggests more s slow and sizable things. Um, you might not like it, but for me, this is my own personal like batch. And in any given batch, I try to s split my time and, and actually link it down to like days or hours where I split myself between early wins, um, experimentation time, and then late wins. And um, what to me, what that means is as an with my experience, I often know of a way to solve a, a problem before I get started. But the shiny new toy, like looking for the bunny rabbit squirrel moment uh, in me each time, which I know a lot of us have, draws me towards not doing the thing that I know would make me successful. And it's very hard to put that back in the box. So using something like this is a better way to do that. And so what I do is I split my time into making sure I'm set up for success, and then I allow myself the time whereby I look at for things that could actually be experimental, that actually, if they come off, would be great, but if they don't, oops, um, at least then the late wins can come in and make it even more successful, or I can go back to my early wins and just finish off what I was doing. And that way, um, you're able to um, allow for opportunity to really get that, those kickers that allow you to, to, to go beyond what you thought you were capable of. Um, and so what, what makes a good experiment? Um, number one, you've got to know what success looks like. Like, don't start an experiment to try and look at a new framework or a, a new package or uh, a new service provider, don't start them unless you actually know that you know when you're going to be done because there lies madness. Um, the other thing is like pulling it off has to make you one of these three things, happier, faster, or richer. If, it doesn't, if the experiment doesn't make you one of those things, then it's just like you're just shooting in the dark and it's, it's a waste of time. But what what I would recommend is if you're trying to be successful, if you're trying to achieve uh, scale uh, in the first, uh, first 90 days being working on a project, etc., try and create a bunch of these batches whereby it's very clear to you that you can have uh, success, early success, experimental success, and late wins. And if you can build a bunch of those up, it really gives you like these moments when the people around you can see that you are capable of delivering and of introducing new things. And I've found this to be um, really, uh, really practical in building trust between myself and the people around me. Um, and this, I've had to reapproach this um, again in the last six months um, as I shifted into working as the CTO at, at Pixar in the last six months from being in back in the consulting world for three or four years. Um, my second tip is what I call so what, um, which is an acronym. It's a bit vague. Stack overflow. What you're talking about? Um, and um, it's a really um, it's a really technical thing, which is my, it's my recommendation for whenever you're going to, whenever something appears on like Hacker News or some Reddit Python or something, or you get it in your newsletter and you're like, that looks amazing. 
I should go and look at that because that looks like it's going to solve widget Y. And we always have a problem with widget Y. So we really should go and look at that. And it's my way of working out if I go and adopt and look at this thing, will uh, have more people found all the problems that I'm going to find, or am I going to be the person writing the Stack Overflow posts that, no, that have no answers? Um, and so that's why it's like if you, what I do is I like go and find something that I think will probably a, like be a problem, like if I was a front end framework, something to do with like pagination being out of bounds or something like that. Things I know that are always a problem is like handling exceptions or testing, uh, testing not working, those kind of things. And I search on Stack Overflow. And if Stack Overflow goes, what? Then I don't adopt it yet. It's not ready. It's not ready. For, I don't want to be the person. I'm, I'm 36 now. I'm too old for being the person creating the Stack Overflow posts. Like, I'm the person that finds them and copies and pastes the answer and, and uses it. That's, that's, that's how you scale. Okay. <laughs> so there was another one. I, I, found, I, I found a screenshot, and I didn't put it in because I didn't want to draw the screenshot. Um, of, it was like an O'Reilly book, and it was like copying and pasting Stack Overflow. It was like a book on how to copy and paste. It was, uh, it's going to be a hit, I'm sure. Um, the third one... Um, is uh, I feel like we have an obsession with like creating the perfect script that allows you to hit a button and it will rebuild your environment from scratch, create all of the resources, build all the code, deploy it all, run a scalable, scalability test, and then uh, rainbows come farting out the end or something. like. There's this like obsession that the, that I've seen again and again of like having a, a scalability script that essentially allows your organization to like survive until you become Facebook and people spend forever like polishing that script or that set of Travis tasks or whatever. But I know repeatable is not doesn't equal scalable. But it's way better than living on Hope Island, which was another thing that I got from my, um, uh, one of my sales managers when I was in corporate land. He's my, his favorite phrase whenever somebody would bring some, a, a sales deal to him as like a dead cert, he would go, like, are you sure about that you've got the sign-off from this person? And they would say, yeah, I, I, I'm hoping to see him next week. And he would just, like, shout, you're living on Hope Island at them. And, and they would just be sent away until they got off Hope Island. Because Hope Island is a beautiful place. It's the sun shines there. There's always pina coladas on tap. But you don't want to live on Hope Island. You want, you, you, you want to live on Sure Shore. I don't know, um, something like that. Um, but um, repeatable is 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 a um, something that you should really aim for. And what the way that works for me, and I know I'm doing it wrong, but I have various markdown files that I can take one of my empty. Ubuntu images, and I can literally paste line by line until I have a running environment. It, to, to make that so that it was a set of scripts that I could run that would, that would auto-create the instance for me and then make sure it had all of the right permissions and that I was logged in and like, then I'd be worrying about like secrets management and stuff. And I don't want to worry about secrets management because then I'd be worrying about is it, um, is my secrets management store always available and scalable? And like, my notepad is always available. Trust me. Um, and so I, my, sometimes I just feel like we just need to, when you're listening to the talks today, just work out where the, where your line is around making sure that you can repeatedly do some of the advice that people are giving you today. And the key thing there is that you should be able to know what your time to recovery is. And so for me, 
I know that I can run through the steps on my notepad for recreating our environment in half an hour. And I know that my company is totally fine with it taking half an hour between everything being gone and everything being back again. So I do not need to improve on that script anymore. I just need to make sure that if I get hit by a bus, somebody else knows how to run that set of things, which it's quite clear. clear. Um, and so the only reason that I believe you should actually Personally, I believe if you're a company of my size and you have a problem with, with rebuilding your environment, you should look at, can I actually improve my time to recovery or actually does the business not give a monkeys? And, and this, is really, this is really the setting us up for the rest of the day. This tip here, we are, we're going to hear from some amazing people doing amazing things for the next two days. Every year, I come away from ScaleConf going, flip, some people are too clever for their own good. And wow, aren't, aren't we doing amazing things? But at the same time, I then all sometimes work, walk away thinking, I, my stuff doesn't matter. But actually, the, the, the one thing I would encourage you, as you look at the, what's, what's being spoken, and when people come up here and make very definitive statements of what you should do about certain things, try and understand how you can apply the spirit of what they're saying rather than a letter to your organization. You know, that, that's, that comes from that phrase like, follow the spirit of the law, not the letter of the law, because you can, like, accountants are really good at finding ways around the letter of the law, and sometimes it's nice to find an accountant who likes to follow the spirit of the law as well as the... Uh, as the letter of it. Because whatever you do, you're doing it wrong. And if you have any doubt in your mind that you're doing it wrong, just write a little blog post about what you're doing and post it on Hacker News, and you will find and fully understand how you are doing it wrong. Um, but um, again, coming when somebody tells you you're doing it wrong, unwind it and try and look at what, what, is, what is the spirit of what they are trying to say rather than the letter of it. And that, that really helped for me because like a lot of the hand tip typed like command lists that I have are based on me understanding where I was doing it wrong. Um, because I was doing it wrong and now I'm doing it less wrong. but still wrong. Number five. Make sure you're scaling efforts actually tie back to impact. And this is one of the, um, the things that I think product management has done a very good job of, the, pro the world of product management. And from a, I, I feel like from a DevOps perspective, um, we have often uh, kind of dismissed this and tried to focus on like the work in front of us. And the best tool that I found, there are tools, there's so many different frameworks and tools and stuff. The one that I found that works for me, I was introduced to by a friend of mine called Steve, um, which is called impact mapping. And it has these four stages. Um, you have your goal, your actors, your impact, and your deliverables. And the, the goal should be driven by the business. It should be something that's measurable, should be linked back to success. Uh, the actors are the people that are involved with actually impacting and uh, infiltrating that, that goal. Um, the, the actual impact is how those actors can achieve that goal. And then the deliverables is the specific things that will actually allow them to have that impact. And uh, I don't believe that enough times we have challenged the people that, that ask us to do something or even challenged ourselves when looking at our, what we are planning to do that week or quarter and said, can I tie back what I'm doing to the goal and to a measurable impact? And um, so, if, like, you could, this, is, this example is just pulled from uh, the impactmapping.org website, um, but you can, I, I think, you can quite easily see if somebody comes to you and says, like, we need to make things faster. It's like, great. 
sure, I can make things faster. Give me some more money and I'll spin up more instances. Like, you could do that. And then you could get to do your pet project, which might be to spend some time with Terraform and uh, auto-scaling instances. And you're like, woohoo, somebody told me to make things faster. I can do that. But how do you know if what you've done is enough? How do you know when to stop? How do you know which parts of what things to make faster? Um, and so being able to use something like an impact map to really drive people back to uh, what things must I do that allow me to have the greatest impact, that allow me to know when I'm done, know I'm successful, and to make you successful. So like, if viewing more ads is the one thing that's going to help grow the advertising revenue and better pagination is the, is the way in which that then if you want to make something that caches the index for the for the for the tables for pagination so that you can jump from page 1 to page 60 with without any uh, touching the database at all that that now makes sense as a deliverable to actually help the company achieve its goals and it's much easier as, a, as an operational team to be able to justify the time it takes, the people involved, all of those things if you're actually looking to map your, uh, your impact. Um, so this, this example is, um, this is much more um, uh, linked to what, what we're doing at, at Pixar. Um, so those numbers are made up because I didn't want to actually put the numbers. But you can imagine we would have numbers, um, goals such as grow to 10,000 active clients um, with only 50 internal staff. Like that might be a goal for us to achieve. Um, the actors we have, we have our employers, we have uh, brokers, we have the actual clients who are employees of the employers, we have our internal staff. And, and once I was faced with this uh, this picture of what the impact we want to have, I was then much easier able to return to the reality of what we, were, we, what we had at Pixar. And the reality had was our customer database was a Google Sheet. Yay! Uh, our data warehouse was uh, CSVs and Excel files in Google Drive. Yay! Our business tools for like operationalizing the value we were giving to the customer are third-party SaaS tools that are all isolated from each other. Yay! Um, you can see why I was hired. Um, uh, our client self-service tools, none. Our employer self-service tools, none. Um, our comms were a bulk SMS where, in place where people paste in a message and upload a spreadsheet and press send. Um, shared Gmail accounts and uh, Vo VoIP phones, because that's advanced. Um, so you can see how this reality and these goals are quite far apart. Um, it's quite hard to, to achieve those things when that's your reality. Um, so uh, what, we, what we had to do was in, in, in three months get ourselves off of Google Sheets. That was my first, like we just, it's like, Google, especially because it's a finance company, the answer to anything is like make another Excel file um, because Excel cr runs the world, basically. And you can do anything with Excel. It's amazing. But it's also blow your brains out as well. Um, what we were able to do in three months was take all of our customer data and our client data and merge, put that into an, an operational um, system and we what we this is the kind of the root of that just enough scale to survive what we didn't realize that was that Google Sheets actually has a limit um, of two thousand two million cells on one sheet um, and the week after we turned this on with three months of work turn it on somebody copied and pasted some a uh, some backup data into the main spreadsheet, and we discovered there is a limit on Google Sheets. There's two million, and we hit it a week after we transitioned. So we survived. Just enough scale to survive. Um, so what we built was um, applying those laws of how can you have some early wins, some experimentation, and then some late wins. Um, we used Django for our back end because 
I have written many, many hours and hours of Django, and I was like, I know how to do this. I know how to build a REST API in front of that. It doesn't take long. Um, we can do that. So we started building all of our data models. Then we looked at the fact that the goal is for us to have a very few number of staff serving a very large number of customers. So each, each staff member is responsible for supporting 1,000 to 2,000 clients. So they need to be able to have a single pane of glass where they can look at the record and actually make business decisions and act like they remember the last call that that person made six months ago, rather than like when you phone telecom and they've got amnesia and they're like, sorry, you're a customer. Um, it's what's weird about telecom is I, I have, they provide a service to my front door and yet they still have the address of my house three houses ago on my bill. It's like you provide a service to my front door. How can you not have the right address on my account? But anyway, legacy systems. Um, we don't have those problems. We just have Google Sheets. Um, but my experimentation came on, on what we actually used as our API layer. And the, that was where the experiment f could sit because I knew how to solve the problem. The late win was if my experiment with GraphQL didn't work, my late win would have been to just use Django REST framework to build REST APIs. So I could clearly see what the experiment looked like. And so we investigated GraphQL. GraphQL came out of Facebook, um, and they've actually been using it for many years in private and then made it publicly available, and there's a whole community that has sprung up around building uh, servers and clients for GraphQL. And what it enables you to do is stop the madness that is creating like 15 different versions of REST endpoints because somebody wants a very small query which just returns like the product title and the price. Somebody else wants a query that returns like the product, the variant, the, the, how many sizes there are, all the prices, the prices that there were, all the reviews, and, and like the madness that becomes um, how many different uh, REST endpoints you end up building in order to make your application responsive so that when somebody just wants the product title and the price, you don't send them the entire product catalog because um, that's what you can do, but you don't really want to do that if you want to optimize it. So GraphQL allows you, it's much closer to uh, SQL in the sense that you can specifically specify, is that a word? Specifically specify the fields that you want from different models in your system and you can follow the relationships down. So you describe the shape of your data um, in the query and then it will return you the the data in the JSON format of the in the same shape that you made the request, um, and so when I, I listened to a few talks, I spent some hours tinkering around. I looked to see are there any tools in the la in the land that I understand, which is Django, for me to be able to adopt those things. And then when I discovered that there was, um, I was able to adopt that and the experiment was successful. There were other experiments that weren't successful, but that one paid off. And it's actually enabled us to, um, we've got a team of three, but we've managed to migrate all of this data and build a whole set of um, front end tools and back end um, scheduled tasks, etc., all around this ability, which is the speed of development we've got has become because of GraphQL. So, it's given us that, that win. Um, and so we, um, but the fallback was there. The fallback would have been a, a REST API or a set of REST APIs. So now we have our uh, internal React app. And because we have no uh, browsers, et cetera, that we don't control involved in any of this, like we can say, we don't support IE9 <laughs> or something random. We can just support what we want to support, and if somebody doesn't have the right browser, we go and upgrade it. Um, like that's, it's a nice world to live in sometimes. Um, 
And then we use Django for our public website, and we use um, uh, Junebug and Vumi for our uh, public USSD application for, uh, for people being able to do a little bit of self-service, find out when the office hours are, etc. And then the second experiment that we did was um, Obviously, working in, in Django, we are used to using Celery uh, to partner with Django to do um, background, scheduled tasks, etc. So we, we started writing batch jobs and scheduled tasks to do the kind of things that we needed to do. Um, uh, but then we stumbled across uh, a package from Airbnb called Airflow, and that enabled us to be able to see how we could run large-scale task-driven uh, processes that we were able to identify where batch jobs had failed, etc., rerun specific steps. Um, and so, again, adopting the tools that, that we had seen have a mature life cycle enabled us to get that, that, those, those wins that we would never have been able to build a workflow engine the size of Airflow without many, many man hours but we knew we would always be able to fall back to Celery if we got stuck. And, and we had to do that. So we had to run um, thousands of credit checks um, one day, because that's how we keep on top of our clients, make sure they're not in too much debt, et cetera. And um, Airflow did, wasn't suited to be able to spawn like thousands of tasks of the same type and run them in, in parallel if, if those, the, the size of those tasks isn't understood at the beginning. It works really well if you know, like, we process these thousand files every Monday. It's great for that, but it's not good if it's results from a database. So we fell back to, uh, to Celery, and, it, and that's worked fine. Um, so those two things alone have really been following that kind of model of get some early wins, experiment and have the potential for the, the exponential growth and then have late recovery, late wins if you need to, like return to the things that you know. Um, so that's what it looks like today. And then over the next six months, um, all of the, those third party systems that I talked about will be pulled in and integrated. Um, we, um, we have to deploy um, some kind of ledger, probably blockchain. Um, we're not doing it so that we get an extra round of funding. Um, we're doing it because we have to keep track of people's money and they get very snotty if you delete database records when it's their money. Um, and um, so all of those things will be built into this core and the, like the voice tools will be actually be pulled in using WebRTC so it's actually embedded in the, in the client interface. So Hopefully, I can come back in two years' time or something and say it was successful and I've still got a job. Or here's another way in which I failed. <laughs> Version 13 of Mike is the one that is going to succeed, honest. Um, so lastly, I just want to go through a quick uh, how we end go through the process um, of making the software that, allows us, that has allowed us to produce um, uh, an operational system that uh, in three months um, we've we've what my sort of principle and philosophy was pick things that are ready to scale but don't actually scale them and so what we did was like around the planning we use we use Asana because the rest of the company is happy with lists tasks in lists but we from a technology team, we use their boards, and so everybody else in the company thinks it's just a list of tasks, but then we reorganize those tasks in, in like a Kanban style. But to them, they just think this bug that they raised is now fixed. And that's, it's simple things like that that actually enable the rest of the company to be able to not worry about your operational ways of working. Um, simple, but it, it's helped with the with the the relationship with the business, we have we have some, um, one of my colleagues um, loves to say it would be nice if, and so she has her place where she can put her list of things that it would be nice if. Um, I might get her a T-shirt that says it would be nice if, because the things that she says would be nice, but we also 
don't have a system. When it comes to development, um, we made the, some people think, crazy choice of having a mono repo, and it's working for us. Apparently, it won't scale. But I don't care right now, because it works for now. And it will work as I, I believe, um, I can't remember who said it, but it was someone last year or the year before, that this will definitely scale for us to grow 10 times. And I have no clue what our world is going to look like when we have grown our team and our customers by 10 times. And I'm sure there'll be problems that I can't see and there'll be problems that I definitely think won't ever happen that will happen. But for now, we have a mono repo which means that we have a folder for each of our, op of our systems inside that. We have the, the development environment bootstrap scripts like the Docker Compose, which enables you to boot up our entire uh, environment. All of the CI scripts and all of the deploy scripts, etc., are in one place. So I have to keep switching between different repos and trying to check out different branches, etc. I have one place, and it's working, honest. And it's making us very productive. And it just means that the, the team can either run just, I'm working on one folder, one of the systems, and I'm running just it locally. Or I can, they can run Docker Compose and build and run all of the systems in containers except the one that they're working on, and then run that in live. It, it's, it's been a pleasure. So I recommend it if you're three people. I have no idea if you're 30 people whether it works. It works for people with 3,000 apparently, um, but it's maybe the middle bit that's going to be a problem. Um, so we'll just stay at three. Um, for the build environment, we use so for development we use GitLab.com, and I know that went down, but it didn't bother me because it's Git, and we look we work locally for a day. It's like we survived without having continuous deployment for a day. It's like the world still continued to revolve. Um, and if we wanted, we could create our own instance of GitLab because it's open source. Magic. Um, on the build side, we use GitLab as well. So in our config, we have the GitLab YAML file. And we, depending on what you prefix your branch name with, depends on which parts of the system it builds. And then when master gets, when you land into master, the whole system gets rebuilt, and it takes about 12 minutes because I've got a really badly optimized Docker container sitting in there somewhere. Um, but I don't care because I don't deploy more than every 15 minutes. So I don't care. I'm not going to go and optimize it yet. Um, and that runs through a test build. And uh, just a tip, if you like GitLab, we have a mono repo, and GitLab comes with a container registry for every single um, repo. But if you want to have multiple Docker, con uh, Docker containers, that's a problem, because now you can't have a latest tag for every one. However, with your account, you can actually create lots of empty repos and just use them as a Docker repository. So that's what I do. We have a mono repo and then an empty repository for every single subcomponent. And the build script builds them and then pushes them, pushes the finished containers into the empty repo. Um, and it works. Thank you, gitlab.com. Um, so we use GitLab for our storage as well. And then we. We don't use AWS. I'm sorry, guys, even though you're a sponsor. Um, uh, we use Hetzner. They were last year's sponsor. Yay! Um, <laughs> maybe next year I'll move. Um, but we, when we, when we mig just a, a, a relatable fact for you, when we migrated from this 2 million cell spreadsheet over to our new operational system and we deployed all the Django and migrated all the data of like three years of business transactions. Our Postgres database, when backed up, was four megabytes. OK? So we didn't need some massively scalable RDS thing. We have a 500 Rand Hetzner server running Ubuntu. The first thing I did was apt get upgrade. Then I installed Docker. Then I copied and pasted off the internet the rancher 
platform as a service inside Docker command, and then I ran all of our configs that are Docker Compose and Rancher configs on top of it, and now I have a system. And how long did that take me? And does it scale? No. But, <laughs> but I don't need it to yet because I haven't hit my limit, but I know for a fact that um, all of the tools that we have used, if our Git builds run too slow, I can create a custom instance of GitLab on a massive AWS server and spin up lots of workers and get everything to build in, in 20 seconds. I don't need to yet, but I can do. With, the, um, with Rancher, Rancher can deploy, it can have multiple backends, so you can deploy to Kubernetes, you can deploy to uh, Docker Swarm. I don't need to yet, but all I need to do is tick a little box and add another host on my Rancher control panel, and now I have Kubernetes behind my, my images rather than uh, Rancher's native thing, which is another thing to do with cattle. Cattle, there you go, obvious. Um, so really, that's, um, that's how we have set up. It's like everything in here is ready to scale. And I have not chosen anything that can't scale, um, and other people are scaling them, so I know they can scale but I personally don't need to right now. And that would be my final encouragement to you. It's like, look at these things that I've talked about. Work out which things for you right now. Go back to that impact map. What can you do right now that impacts the metrics that matter to, your, to you and your company? If it doesn't, then go back and say no to people about doing stuff. Because if you want to survive and be an, a valuable asset to your organization, to your team, to the company that you run or to the company that you work for, then look for the ability to be a net value to the company every quarter that you're existing there as an employee. Because like the industry will thank you for being somebody who adds a lot of value rather than being a tax on the organization, rather than just being the guys or the girls that sit in the corner and say no to everything and, and moan every time and that we just go and talk to when everything goes down. Like It will help our industry no end if we can link what we do on a daily basis back to the impact that matters for the organizations that we care about. Cool. Thanks. Do we have time for questions? Yeah? Okay. Any questions? There's, there's one at the back. What's that? There is no questions. Nothing to question. Come on, Duncan, faster. Uh, good morning. With that mono repo of yours, do you have a problem um, with embedded credentials? So maybe you wonder if you have a team of 20 um, that these credentials could get leaked? Yeah, we don't put any credentials in the repo. Uh, everything that would be a credential is an environment variable. And the Rancher is very good at letting you set environment variables at, uh, at create time. So that's the way we've avoided it. Um, I don't fully understand secrets management and all that stuff, so I don't need to, because I just use environment variables. Apparently I'm doing it wrong, but it works for me. Um, and we haven't yet had any instance of somebody committing a credential by mistake, um, because we do practice uh, uh, peer review, and even if they did commit it, I, I have done the old git rewrite history thing. It's, there's a really long stack overflow, stack overflow, yay, post on how to like pull out an individual commit that had a credential in it. Um, anyone else? <laughs> Run, Duncan. I'll give him my mic, hang on. I really wanted to make Duncan run. Um, you mentioned uh, your markdown file with instructions you need to do to, to bootstrap a new system. How often do you test this and how confident are you in that process? Um, I probably test it uh, every few months, um, usually because somebody uh, breaks their laptop or something like that, because it's pretty much similar, the, the script between like booting a, a laptop dev environment and between our production. Um, 
and uh, I like to destroy our staging every now and again and redo it. Um, and that, those steps are becoming the kind of statement of work for somebody else smarter than me to write some better scripts. So I think that that process, again, will we'll go through it. But like backing up, um, if there's anyone from Hetzner, come, come find me afterwards. I want to ask why you only give us FTP backup space. It's the 2017 guys. Um, but backups at the moment are like literally me sitting there every morning running the backup commands. Um, so I, those, those then get re tested every every week by us rebuilding our local environments. But yeah. On over there. Hi oh, Mark. Um, just a quick question. And just to understand maybe from your perspective, from your experience, typically um, when there's a goal of a, of attracting or getting 10,000 customers. As a CTO, do you, do you look to say, we'll address the 10,001 customer at 8,000? Or do you look at saying, um, in my mind, I'm targeting, let's say, 15,000. But uh, to the business, I'm really keeping the only, only understanding about 10,000. So I just want to understand how you, you tackle that. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I. I have a mixed I have a mixed mindset, which is I personally am always building for there being extra. So if ten thousand is their goal, then I'll aim for our systems to be able to cope with like twenty. Because I presume then if we actually like that's a reasonable the difference on system level between 10, 10 and 20 is not that much. What's madness is like if the company only needs to support 10,000 clients is you building a system that can cope with a million. Um, but the, the reason why like impact mapping is, is great is it allows you to actually understand is, it, is the goal that the business have even the rational for everybody else that's involved. Like, is there any way that our sales team could sign up 10,000 customers? And by being involved in that process, rather than just allowing those things to be given to you, actually you're able to say, there's no point in me building for 10,000, even if that's the stated goal that's talked about at the all hands meeting, because I know for a fact that we ain't gonna get beyond five. And so that's, and then you don't need to build for 20, you build for 10. And, and that's, that's the approach I generally take. But being involved in the process, like people seem to have an aversion to like meetings and strategy because it's like a waste of time. If you do those meetings, you avoid so much wasted time because you're actually involved, you have a voice, you're a seat at the table, etc. Cool. I think we're one more if there is one. There you go. And then we're done. Right there. Hi. Um, from your perspective, um, saying doing just enough, and, and especially coming from a startup perspective, how much testing is just enough and test coverage? Um, testing is something that I was late to test driven development. I started coding when I was like 15, 16, and tests were madness. It was only when I returned back to coding after my stint in sales and marketing that I had a friend who told me I was doing it wrong and uh, encouraged me to look at test-driven development. And since that point, I, I don't feel comfortable without there being lots of test coverage. Um, so I've just instilled that in my team Nothing goes in without us having, we, I think generally we have like, there's four or five X more lines of tests than there is of code. Um, the area where we currently have a problem is the, um, uh, I forget what the fancy term for it is, is the end-to-end the, the -end user experience test of like, can the user log in, click on the search button, find the results, et cetera, that end-to-end that exper -end, end experience. Um, that's where our biggest uh, gap at the moment, but from a, from a unit test perspective, I, I don't think 
you can, I don't think you should skimp on that personally. I don't think it's worth it because for me, it's become something that allows me to relax when coding that I know that um, I can not be involved in the code on a, for a two weeks because I'm off working on some strategy. I can come back in, not know what's been changed between the team members, make a small change and know that my small change has impacted or hasn't impacted the code base because we've got good test coverage. So it enables me to dip in and dip out without screwing everything up. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Um, 